but we still do it. Yeah, it's still an Okay, I'll leave you one. So a very quick question before we start. So how many of you did suffer uh, a UR problem in, in lab one? Okay, and suffer here means you try to send something on the UR and then the radio unit to the BC with the other way around and it doesn't work as expected. <laughs> Excuse me. And, and this is a bit different than the problem of uh, radio to radio connection, right? I'm just more asking about the UART itself. Like you you, you receive garbage or characters out of order or you don't receive anything. Uh, so those that raise their hands, still the same thing. Like you, you face the UART issue, is that correct? Or part of this was the, the radio problem? Radio, okay, so can, like only for the UART, can you raise your hand? Or you guys are not able to decouple them from each other? So again, like the definition, what I mean by a, by a UR problem is it's not that, for example, you send a character and it appears in another one screen because you kind of get connected to another radio unit. No, what I mean is you are connected fine to both receiver and sender of the radio, but the UR, uh, what software they are using right now, the body or the other one? Real terminal or the body? Both of them, okay. So. Yeah, so I'm more asking about those terminal issues. Like, are you able to receive the characters in your BC correctly or are you face the issues? Did anyone face any issue with that? Okay, that's that's good to hear. Okay, is there any other issue you want to share? Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So we will um, we we work on this starting from lab two. So we wanted to do this in lab one, but uh, th the problem is we also want to give you the time. So I can be very strict and say let's have time slots, 10, 20 minutes time slots, and this is your time slot. If you don't demo through, through it, you just lose your demo slot. But on the same time, I know some of you might have already finished the lab before and some might not, right? So I wanted to be a little bit flexible on, okay, let's do it in a first come first serve basis. Uh, and then after the first hour of the lab, we'll start doing this. If, I, if we're going to have slots, this must in fact start from the beginning of the lab, right? That's that's basically the trade-off we're trying to address. 
but but that's that's definitely a good suggestion and I will try to do it from lab too. Yeah, please. Uh, are we able to register to access the labs after 11 p.m.? My understanding is that with the access card, you, and this is something I asked even from last year, the first year we offered the course. You guys have this room exclusive for 4DS. We're not sharing the lab with anyone else. And this is because I know the labs are designed not to finish within the lab session, right? Especially for coming labs, which might be a little bit more involved. So the expectation is you have your access card, you have access to the lab, feel free to arrange your time accordingly, and then come to the lab when you want. With regard to the after 11 p.m., this might be something not with the lab room, but rather with the building. This is what I don't understand. So did you come to the lab after 11 p.m. trying to scan your card and it doesn't open? I see. So does it mean that the access is programmed only until 11? That's I don't know. Maybe this is a question. OK, let me reach out to the IT, like Steve in our, in our department, and then understand. Uh, this is the first time I hear this, to be honest. I hear some of you had issues during the weekend, but only because of the building access, not because of the lab access. Uh, yeah, please. According to the second lesson, uh, some individuals are allowed access to the IT units after 11. And he explained that there are some people who do have access. Yeah, but what is the definition of some? I, I will I will talk to the IT uh, guys. I mean, uh, we, we will see. I, I didn't know that there was a constraint, so I will ask what is the current constraint and whether we can really kind of get an exception for 4DS. Okay, thanks. Please. Uh, okay, so this is the last question. Yeah, okay, so so let's let's revisit again the, the logistics or, or the time plan of the course. So lab two. It's a lab, and then more or less overlapping with lab two, there is the first project. Um, we will release the project document, if not next Monday with lab two, this couple of days after. Uh, but the deadline for the project will be one week after lab two, if I remember. You have the, the detailed calendar with you already. Uh, but afterwards, to, to answer your question directly, we have after lab two and project one, we combined the second project with lab three. So we call it lab three slash project two. So it's just that's the last thing. It's both the lab and the project together. So we give you the full instruction. It's not like lab two where we separate the lab and the project in two separate demos, two separate documents. No, lab three and project two, both are in the same document. We give you a few instructions at the beginning that you, it's more like the guided lab. This is the main difference between the lab and the project is that the lab is more guided. So we give you exercises to go through, coding to fill, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lab three and project two are combined. So this that's the last thing we have in, in, in labs. Good. And again, like the detailed calendar is already with you on, uh, on, on lecture zero. So you should be able to see exactly what should we demo, how much time we spend for every lab and project. Good. Any other question? Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so today we are going to uh, discuss another topic uh, that goes very well with our previous two lectures of IOs and then sensors and actuators. Um, how sensors and actuators really operate on, on real MCU setups, right? Uh, again, this is, this is a part of a topic that is not new, completely new to you, because definitely you must have seen this already in the second year course. Uh, this is any, any elementary course in interfacing would, would, would cover that. But as usual, we'll try to cover the basics and then delve more into how to apply this to our lab setup and also discuss more advanced challenging uh, uh, problems that we might face when we deal with real interrupts in real use case. So the outline we're going to discuss is, OK, bowling versus interrupt and then interrupt processing. What are the steps to do the interrupt and some of the advanced interrupt related issues? So. Polling, I would say most of you already might know what is polling, right? Can someone briefly explain what is polling? You must have seen polling before, yeah? Please. 
Yeah, you, the processor need to constantly keep looping and checking for input from your sensor, for example, from your I/O device or from your peripheral, right? Uh, and well, this is already written in the slide. But what? Maybe another question is: Did you already use polling in in any earlier course? Did you apply it, for example, in 2DX? Yeah. So what did you do there? Like, can can you teach me a bit? A, a, a purpose and the theme of that course is to connect the dots together, right? To try to consolidate the knowledge from other courses, the ones that you might have forgotten them, the ones that maybe you did, but with little understanding or some of you understand it very well, the others are not. And then we we all refresh our minds with this. Can someone remind me what did you do for the polling in 2DX or any other project? My understanding is you did it, right? This is what I got from the previous answer of the question, right? So what did you do? Yes. Sorry, can you raise your voice a little bit? Programming a key bag. Okay, so you program the processor of the MCU to keep bowling for a key bag entry. Okay, and did you do one bowling for all the keys of the key bag or one bowling per each key. So basically, maybe in, 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 and this is related to our discussion. So a very basic naive implementation of a bowling is for every single peripheral, which is a key in your key bag, you would need a separate loop or bowling mechanism. But this is basically very inefficient. And in fact, it will conflict with each other because should I bowl for letter A or for number one, right? So. Probably what you have implemented is you had only one polling for all the keys. So if any key is pressed, then do something. Right? Is that correct? OK, good. Thank you. So that's that's great. So basically this is polling. So I can in its its basic implementation. I have only one peripheral and then I will keep looking for it like uh, polling. OK, do you have something ready for me? What does it really mean? Like as we discussed in the previous two lectures, usually a sensor or an IO device when it has a data ready for you, for example, if you press a key, some sort of a register is going to be written. The processor is going to check, is there data in that register or, not, or in that buffer or not, right? If there is data, then there's something you need to do. Otherwise, I will keep polling again. If you look into what you have done in the UART setup, which you have seen in lab one and you would see in lab two and almost all other labs, um, can you identify here what might be the, the code line or, or the code snippet that is mimicking a polling setup? All of you almost done with lab one, right? So for this piece of code, what is the line or or the code snippet that is implementing yeah, polling? Be the exactly. Thank you. So basically in in uh, in our board, the FM66, we have two sort of UART setups or functions. One of them called blocking. The other one is non-blocking. They can be read or write. Uh, blocking means processor does nothing else at all, right? So this is the polling mechanism. I believe this is the part that you start lab one with, right? So you do polling with a blocking read or write. The processor will keep looking for data. Otherwise, I'm just waiting, do nothing. And if I want it to be interrupt, well, you can imagine I will use the non polling function, right? Good. The simplest format of implementing this read blocking is just simply have an infinite loop until you have something. And then once you have something, you break out of the loop. Okay, so now with regard to, well, your friend here, for example, mentioned you have already implemented this before. What is the problem with this? If I'm using polling, what problem am I facing? Well, you mentioned that the way this works is you are storing your processor, keep searching for or keep looking for input from the peripheral. And then once this peripheral has an input, you get it and process it, right? The problem with this is what if this sensor or this input does not have anything? Well, the processor is, in fact, is an infinite useless loop doing nothing else, right? Uh, so that's the problem with the uh, polling is that CPU cannot do anything useful in the meantime while it's waiting for the peripheral or the sensor to provide data. Uh, this is the most naive implementation. Improvements can be added. Uh, for example, I can check multiple IO devices, similar to what your friend said. Instead of checking one key, I can check multiple keys. Instead of checking only the keys of the keypad, I can also check the keypad and some other input as well, right? The more sensors or the more inputs for peripherals you check within your loop, the more efficient you are. But but what is the problem with this? Why I cannot, for example, put all my peripherals if I have 
tens of them into one big loop. What do you think? Everything again has a trade off, right? There is no winning solution. If there is something naive, then well, people will not use it anyway, right? And bullying, in fact, is still used in production. So now the question is, we said most naive implementation of bowling is check only one peripheral at a time within a loop. But this is a waste of time and utilization of the CPU. Then add multiple of them within the loop. But if adding multiple of them within the loop makes it better utilized, so why I don't add all my peripherals, for example, inside the loop, right? So what what is what are we losing with increasing the number of peripherals within the loop? Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much. So now your CPU becomes as a resource for interference. So CPU, which is the computation capability of the processor, is a resource right now that different peripherals want to access to process something. If I add more peripherals or input devices or input output devices within the, my bowling loop, then if someone takes over the CPU, in while well, I'm going through the loop iteration, I picked up, okay, there is a register that has some value, go ahead and process it. Well, others might also have data. And in that case, they will be delayed, right? Or maybe there's some sort of a time limit, then they will become void right now. So the more resources or the more um, IO devices that are competing in this polling loop, the more interference and delays you would have, right? That's the other trade-off. Uh, so th this is the first point we're discussing here. We say, check this one, which is checking multiple IO devices rather than one. Good. This is, we already discussed and what is the design trade-off. The second improvement that might happen is instead of keep checking the status, do some other useful work. So it's still the same line of thought from adding multiple things inside the polling loop, but instead of adding other IO devices, I'm adding some other useful CPU computations, right? So inside my polling loop, most naive implementation is I have one loop with only one checking of one peripheral. Then we said an improvement can be instead of one checking for peripheral, you have multiple of them. And now we are saying this can be a source of interference. Then another way of addressing this is to say, I'm going to add one peripheral and then some other computation that is not IO related, right? It's not uh, based on sensors, something inside the processor itself. Like the CPU would allow it, we would allow it to use some, to add some useful computations in the meantime. Again, what might be the problem with this? Fundamentally, it's still the same problem, but not between IO uh, devices or peripherals, but between the CPU computation itself and the polling. Uh, uh, I.O. device, right? For example, if I have one I.O. device and multiple computation instructions inside a loop, I do, an, I do my iteration, I do the checking, I don't have something ready, but then I go through my computation time, so the CPU is doing something useful in the background. If this thing is taking long time, then the next iteration will be longer. So what if the sensor in the meantime gave me data? And I need to process it as soon as possible. For example, you have frame per second requirements from a camera. Then if your computation time is long, then now you delayed your processing of the data, right? So there is another source of interference now, but between the computation time and the IO handle. Does this make sense? Good. Okay, so this is, again, the question to answer is when do I need to check again? And whether my IO device would have a bounded time, like a time budget, a deadline, right? This would allow me to design my bowling loop correctly. If the IO device does not have um, a very strict timing requirement, then it's okay for waiting for some time. Well, I'm going to do more useful work. If it has a bounded deadline with a very strict and small time budget, then in this case, I maybe add it in only one loop or add very small computation. So I can design my polling my bowling loop, basically, according to the requirements of the IO device. Good. And these are some of the real challenges that, in fact, people are designing bowling for in real systems, right? You know that your sensor is providing you data within a certain time budget. How critical is the data and how critical you need or how fast you want to process it? Accordingly, I do my design, like my, my software design to handle my computation effectively within this time budget. Good. So the trade-off here is between performance or CPU utilization and meeting the requirements of the IO device. Does this make sense? Is there any question? So one challenge I see with discussing these topics is it's something that you heard before. It's usually useful if you hear about something before because it can resonate in your mind, but also sometimes you, your mind might block because our minds are designed to be very lazy. You can say, okay, I know this information before, 
then you really don't listen carefully and then you lose the actual trade-offs we are discussing. So again, a big theme of the course is try to be careful is we start from something you already know, but then we extend it to real industrial challenges. Some of them might you know before, some, some of them you might not know, right? So pay attention to what might be new information for you and refreshing the old one as well. Good. So now the question is, what if in fact my old device cannot even wait for my bowling time and the loop, even if I put it in a single loop, I need to process it immediately. And immediately means like in a very short time period. Can I do this in bowling, first of all? Well, with this design concept, well, theoretically, yes, because you can have one loop per bowling, but if you have multiple bowling, multiple IO devices, in fact, you cannot at all, no matter what you do. If you want to keep good CPU utilization, you cannot also. But what if with all these real setup constraints, I still want to uh, process my IO uh, data immediately? What can I do? Interrupts, exactly. So go to the other way, right? So use interrupts, which is basically the most common way as well. So interrupts is simply the CPU is doing its own stuff in the background. I don't care about the IO device for now, but once the IO has something ready for me, it sends me, well, in its simplest format, you can think of it as like a, a book, right? I have a wire signal telling me, go ahead and process this right now. I have data ready for you, right? That's why it's called interrupt because CPU is busy doing something else and then the I.O. would interrupt the usual CPU bath, like the execution bath of the program, and then take it to do something else. We will see right now what is this something else called. Good. In fact, there are multiple types of interrupts. The one we are talking about right now, which is handling data from sensors, actuators, I.O. devices, is what we call a hardware interrupt, right? And by the way, these slides are already on, on Avenue. Uh, it's the last time I didn't upload the slides before, so you guys. Maybe for those that want to take notes, I, I will make sure I upload them always before the lecture. Um, so the ones we are discussing right now, with the ones that are most related to embedded system interfacing is the hardware interrupts, right? Those are related to devices that want to handle or ask the CPU to do something. But in fact, even in our laptops, we have other types of interrupts aside from the IO devices from keyboard and touch screen and, 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 and mouse, for example. We have what we call software interrupt. Sometimes in software terminology, some of them are called traps, uh, but in, in reality, it's just the same concept. It's a special type of instruction uh, that takes the processor out of context or special exception that would require the processor to do something different. For example, you write a very simple MATLAB or Python code, and then all of a sudden you divide by zero, right? Divide by zero when it goes to the ALU of the processor of your laptop, it's undefined instruction. You cannot really do it. So there's a certain exception defined by a standard, an IEEE standard, in fact. If you're talking about floating point operation or integral operation, it tells you exactly what needs to happen. So with a certain flag in the processor that is being trapped, right? Like it goes to one, which means there is a division by zero right now, and it creates an exception from the hardware to the software, the operating system, and the operating system interrupts your application and gives you the error message. It's in fact what happens in the background you do, when you do something illegal, especially an exception uh, handling about the, the ALU operations, right? So the ALU would complain, set a flag, the flag will trigger an exception in the operating system. It's a software interrupt. And the operating system stops your application, gives you the error message. Good. So one very simple example, well, you already mentioned one example, uh, which is good, like, uh, using a keypad simply to uh, to take an input. Here we are assuming instead of keypad, what if you have a switch? And then this switch, if it's pressed with a certain pattern, then you change the color of an RGB uh, LED. Yeah. Um, so I can implement this example using bowling or interrupts. So let's discuss a little bit what would happen if I want to design for that or for that. For a bowling, I would need to write a, a C code that checks regularly for the switch input, right? Because again, when you press a switch, a register is changed from zero to one or one to zero, and then you will keep bowling for this register change value. <laughs> the problem again is this might be too slow. Um, and it's a, it's an underutilization of the CPU time, as we said. So the faster the response needed, the more often the user need to check. And so if I want to change the LED colors immediately after I check, after I press the button, I cannot have my loop to be very large, right? I have to be to have it very, very quick. In the same time, as we said already, it's non-scalable. 
non-scalable is the actual engineering term of not being able to add multiple IO devices. Like how many IOs you can add, right? You have one, well, bullying can work. Two might be if you don't have very strict timing requirements, but if you have 10 or 15 or 20, well, it almost becomes impossible, right? Because you will never be able to meet the timing requirements of all of them. Because they all will be in one loop, right? So this is what we mean by non-scalable here. Uh, so it's difficult to build a multi-activity system, or basically a system with multiple IO devices that can respond quickly for every one of them. Uh, and the point or the reason for this is the response time right now, which is if you think about software analysis, it's how much time or how many cycles it takes you to execute your loop would depend now on how many IOs you need to check inside them. Okay? For an interrupt, well, one big, well, I wouldn't say this is a disadvantage, but it's a requirement for interrupt. So this is one advantage of bowling is, in fact, you don't need any hardware support. Bowling is just really a simple for loop that you can write in your uh, code to check a certain register. So no special circuitry is required from the hardware. If I want to support interrupts, I told you that there is a wire that has to go from the I.O. to the CPU, and hence there is some special handling needed, right? So you need a specialized hardware, which again we will discuss in a second in detail, and the MCU to detect and run what we call the ISR. Can you remind me what is an ISR? What does ISR refer to? Exactly, thank you so much. That's the interrupt subroutine, which is the piece of software that I told you, well, wow, the CPU is doing its own work. It gets a signal from the I.O. that please leave this normal flow and go ahead and do something else, right? Well, a couple of minutes ago, I said this is something else, right? ISR is this something else, right? This is another piece of code, another context, multiple instructions that you want your CPU to execute if the interrupt is being triggered. Comparing interrupts to bowling, interrupts are more efficient because well, I only uh, uh, bug the CPU if uh, if I have something ready, otherwise the CPU is doing some useful work. And it's fast because it's hardware, there is a wire that goes directly once I have a data ready, I just go ahead and notify the CPU. So I don't have to depend on uh, four, four loop uh, number of cycles dependence, right? And, and maybe this is a general observation that is, is it's a good judgment for you for any engineering work. Uh, so when you compare hardware to software, many things in fact can be done in hardware or in software. One judgment is if you want your behavior to be quick and fast and more predictable, like less variability in the execution time, then which one you're going to take, hardware implementation or software implementation? What do you think? Yeah. Good. So you answered a slightly different version of the question, but this is exactly why I asked the other question. I wanted to generalize the, the observation, right? So interrupts are better from that perspective. That's correct. But I'm trying to generalize, aside from interrupts or, so, or, or bullying, as a general judgment, assume you have something to do with, no with bullying or interrupts, but completely different design problem. You have the option to implement it in software or in hardware. And then we are saying, if you want it to be fast, and quick and less variable in, in terms of response time. Which direction are you going to take? Uh, it's, sorry, can you say it again? It's harder to implement. Harder to implement? Yeah. So you mean in which, like software or hardware? Uh, I... Yeah, it's harder to implement in hardware. That's correct. But but the design constraints I gave, not how much time it takes you. This is another trade-off, which is completely correct. But what I'm saying is that if you want it to be fast, not fast implemented, but rather fast in response time and less variable. Software, okay. So your friend is saying software. What do you think? Hardware, okay. So why hardware? Um, hardware is basically very close. It's much faster. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And and why software? So why you think software is more uh, is is faster in terms of response and less variable in terms of execution? Hardware is faster. Okay. And what about variability in terms of execution time? 
Yeah, well, variability, like in terms of in one time, I can really give you the response in one cycle. Maybe in another instance, exact same hardware and software, I might give you the response in two or three cycles, right? This is what we mean by variability in execution, which means is it always giving you this within that dedicated number of cycles, or it can be variable based on different program behavior, right? Uh, we discussed variability and predictability a bit in lecture zero. So, so again, the concept is you have one task. If it takes variable execution time, which means it, it can take longer or less based on what else is happening in the system, this is called variability, right? So the question now is, first of all, is the concept of variability clear? Does this make sense to you? Yeah, good. So if that's the case, then which one is less variable? Hardware or software? Hardware, good, thank you. So in terms of variability and response, like time, hardware seems to be the better option. That's correct. So what might be the advantage of software? Or variable? Uh, I guess what you meant is you can change easier might be portable modular uh, that's correct yeah okay what else yeah I'll say more flexible more flexible that's correct yeah thank you so so basically that's uh let me go back to this slide because this slide is talking about two special kind of algorithms i'd say or approaches or mechanisms for bullying and interrupt of handling io devices but again the general discussion that we had right now is the, the, the more important one is in fact this this trade-off between software or hardware is not only for bullying and interrupt but for many other problems again if you want your system to be less variable in terms of execution or your task that you're implementing less variable in terms of execution and you want to control the response time to be faster definitely hardware is your option right why because hardware is well this is circuitry, right? This is this is electronics. It's something that if you send a signal from a place to a place, from an IO device to a CPU, it takes fixed amount of cycle, no matter what is happening. It's a wire, right? On the other hand, in terms of software, well, you guys are all very familiar with your own laptops. If you, you, you open MATLAB and then maybe it takes you one hour, and then maybe if you are playing a game in the background, it takes you three hours. Why that's the case? Because the execution time of a certain program is dependent on what else is happening in the system, right? So the more you abstract, the more variability you get based on the system status, and this is the advantage of hardware. But your friend here mentioned another very good uh, uh, advantage of software versus hardware, which is hardware definitely is harder to implement, right? I need an actual circuitry. Here in interrupt, we mentioned I need a special hardware, which we'll discuss in, in a second. You need an interrupt service routine. Uh, handling, you need special registers, you need a, a controller to handle the interrupts. While in software, which is in our case the polling, you don't need anything, right? You can implement everything in software. So it's harder to implement, more cost might be. And the second advantage that your other friend mentioned is software is more flexible, right? So in fact, if I wanted to change my mechanism today versus yesterday, I can easily change my software and recombine and have a new software. In terms of hardware, no, you need to purchase a new board, for example, right? Does this make sense? So these are general trade-offs that, in fact, well, as an engineer or especially a systems engineer, you need always to, to think of them. For us here, maybe it's, it's a more basic question I know, but I want to make sure you all understand. Which one is representing the software versus the hardware approach? Like, we have bowling versus interrupt. Which of them is the software and which of them is the hardware? That's that's some more basic reason. I, I want more people to contribute to the discussion. Yeah, someone. Yeah, please. Calling is software exactly. While interrupt is the hardware, right? That's that's the general mechanism. Good. Another advantage of interrupt is scalable. Why? Because I don't have to put all my IOs inside one loop right now, right? I would anyone that has something ready, it will send me a wire. We know later on that's in fact not infinitely scalable because I cannot have infinite number of wires, right? So every certain board would manage, or in fact, every single architecture would manage certain number of interrupts. Uh, we'll see that we have an ARM M4, so it has a certain number of interrupts that are already defined, and then we implement them. Uh, the other good thing is that the ISR response time, which is the other thing that you, the IO device wants the CPU to, 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 to run, which is the interrupt service routine, does not depend really on what is happening else in the system, right? Because 
same, well, that's mostly, in fact, not completely correct, but because it's a separate piece of software that is executed once you really trigger the interrupt and runs uninterruptedly, right? That's also, you can take this as a grain of salt. We'll see later on that you can, in, fa in fact, interrupt and interrupt the different story. Uh, assuming I cannot really interrupt the interrupt, then the ISR would take a fixed amount of time, which means it's more predictable and response time is faster. Good. Is there any question in these trade offs? Good. So, what is happening in an interrupt is, well, in a normal execution path, there is no interrupt triggered. And in that case, the main code here, which is the first block we have, is running, right? So, the CPU is is executing its own code. And then at one point of time, which is unknown, unpredictable, can happen at any time, so it's even triggered, then the the, the IO device or the sensor or the, the actuator would trigger the CPU to go ahead and do something else. So in that case, you need to go ahead and execute what we call an interrupt service routine. And then once you do this, you need to go back, once you are done with ISR, you need to go back and uh, return all your stack pointers and things we'll discuss in a second right now. And then you get, you go back to your main code, right? So between this time and this time, this is your main task, right? So you have been interrupted for a certain amount of time. Go ahead and do something else, right? For example, you are studying for, for DS4 and then your younger brother came and asked you to help him with something. Then you go interrupted for a few seconds, few minutes, few hours, and then you come back and continue studying, right? This is called an interruption because you switched the context of what you were doing, right? And went ahead and did something else. So between these two blocks in time here, this is why we call it interrupt. The CPU goes out of the normal flow, does something else on the side, and then comes back and continue what it has been executing. Good? Um, so interrupts, especially hardware interrupts, the ones we are concerned with, they are asynchronous. So what do we mean by asynchronous? They are independent of the actual execution flow of the CPU. For example, I can have an interrupt here, or I can have an interrupt here, or here, or here. Based on what? Based on whether my IO device would have data for me ready or not, right? Whether this wire is triggered or not. So it's something that happens external to the CPU instructions. So I call it asynchronous, right? So it's independent of your execution flow. Um, good. And then once you trigger your interrupt, you go ahead and execute this software routine, which is an interrupt service routine that runs as a result or in response to the interrupt. Uh, almost in all modern microcontrollers or embedded devices, we would have an efficient, even based processing, not just polling, because polling can be supported by software anyway, but you would have specialized hardware to really support interrupts based on even based asynchronous process. And you can provide a quick response to events regardless of the program state, complexity, or location, which means once I'm triggered by the interrupt, I will give you certain well guarantees. Of, for example, I'm going to take X amount of cycles to execute your interrupt, which is very important for embedded systems, again, because most embedded systems are real-time systems that you want to respond within a time budget. Again, think of you are in a car, and then the airbag control sends an interrupt to the main processing unit that I need to trigger, in fact, opening the airbag. If you don't respond within a certain amount of time, well, the, the consequences are, are not good. Good. So going back to our main example, we mentioned that we have a switch and we want to change the RGB LEDs. So if I want to do this in interrupt, what would happen is when the switch is being triggered, I would uh, well, the, the main CPU thread would be interrupted. You go to the ISR, execute this ISR, which simply you need to count how many switch counts, how many switch uh, clicks you have done, and accordingly change the color. So you do your count and then go back to the main thread, and then the main thread might be changing the, the LEDs. Uh, maybe another related design point is why. OK, maybe I will ask a little bit higher level question. I will say it's a bonus mark, uh, but then if no one answers, I will guide you through it. So this is one way of designing our example. Remember our example from, from the few slides ago. I had a switch. I had the RGB LEDs, and I wanted based on how many clicks I do in the switch 
I would trigger the LEDs in the, to, to, to display a certain color, okay? So now I'm designing my interrupt in that way, which means the ISR is only counting to me how many clicks are done by the switch, but the main is, count, is the one that is controlling the, the LEDs, right? Is there another way to design that system? Can I have them in a, in a different order? And they execute exactly the same functionality? Now thinking from a system level, this is really what matters, right? If this is, it's not really doing the lab exercise code in 4DS or in 2DX. It's more about why did we make that design choice? And how does it impact us, right? So, yeah, please. It's just a very good process Good, that's a good point. So in fact, instead of making the ISR only do the counting and then report the counting to the main, and then the main is the one that is controlling the LEDs, your friend is saying, well, I can ask the ISR to do everything for me. I do the counting and also control the LED. So they send your name afterwards. So these are two design choices. So why do you think we have picked this one or the other? It's another bonus. Thing. That is the So in, in general, and we will have this discussion later on, you want your ISRs to be very small. You don't want them to execute hundreds of instructions, right? If you're going to put this LED control inside the ISR itself, that means, well, your ISR lines of code, the instructions would be larger, right? And the problem with this, as your friend said, this ISR put in mind that it was really an interrupt, right? It was taking away from the CPU, it's normal flow. And the more time the interrupt takes, the more, in fact, I can also delay other interrupts. Right? So you don't want your ISR, this is a general uh, uh, design. It has a trade-off, another trade-off that we'll come into later on. But generally, the trend is don't make your ISR very long, because that's not good for the system. For that reason, we broke it, only do the counting, and then later on, the main program, or maybe another interrupt, another routine, we do the daily Good? Does this make sense? Okay, so going back to how does this relate to the board we have here, I'm showing you um, the, the piece of, 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 of hardware in the M4, Cortex M4, that is related to our uh, our own interrupt discussion. You will find part of the plug diagram of the Cortex M4. Here we have what we call, um, well, two specialized blocks of hardware. One of them is called optional WIC, which is uh, the wake interrupt controller. And the other one is nested vector interrupt controller, NVIC, right? These two are ARM based, right? That's why we have a Cortex M4. In other processors, they are named differently and they implemented differently, right? But most embedded devices are ARM based right now. So it's a general note for most embedded devices. Uh, and then in addition to these controllers, which is the ones that are really managing interrupts, dealing with them, we also have, well, our interface here. This interface needs to be extended to add the wires we we're talking about, right? You need a special wire flag that comes from the IO device, triggers a one, change a register bit to be one, which means I have a bending interrupt to be serviced. And hence, the controller will, will read that interface, that wire, go back and service the routine. So uh, let's, let's discuss these two controllers in, in a bit of a detail. So the uh, NVEC or the nested vector interrupt uh, controller uh, in, in our Cortex M4, we can handle up to 20, uh, 240 interrupt request signals, uh, non-maskable non interrupts. We'll know now what does it mean to be maskable versus non-maskable. But that means your processor can handle 240 interrupts. That's in fact a huge number of interrupts, right? Think of how many sensors, actuators you would have in your FME, right? Not well, 240 should be more than enough, right? Most of the M series of, of uh, of, uh, of of ARM uh, added, <clears throat> excuse me, added this large number of interrupts because they know that you need to interface to I/O devices a lot, right? So they want it to be more general and generic. <clears throat> the good thing is that from the name, it's called nested and and vector interrupt. So vector because you can handle multiple interrupts at a time, and nested. That's the interesting part. Is in fact you can have an interrupt, and then within the interrupt you can have another interrupt triggered. So an interrupt can trigger an interrupt. Right? So think of, well, forget about interrupts at all for now. Think back of 2SH, 2SI, a normal C program. 
you are in the main, you call a function, and then a function can call another function, another function, another function, right? So you can they go nested in terms of stack of function calls. Nested interrupts are exactly the same thing. I can be executing my main. If I only can serve one interrupt at a time, I will go to the ISR and then come back. Nothing else in the middle can happen. Very simple, good to analyze. In fact, it's, it's good in terms of predictability, but not very scalable because what if your interrupt, while you are doing this interrupt, a more serious interrupt or uh, in the terminology, a higher priority interrupt comes in place. That means if you cannot really serve this higher priority interrupt, it has to wait for the lower one, right? In, in our very common example of automotive, assume that the airbag has to wait for your uh, Wi-Fi, GPS, uh, infotainment unit because it was interrupting the processor. Does it make any sense, right? So you need to handle nested interrupts in that sense, which means a higher priority interrupt can interrupt a lower priority interrupt to, to get the service. Is it determined by the board or could you actually change like the priority? That's an excellent question. Yes, in ARM M4, you can really set the priorities of different interrupts by writing to a special use. That's correct. Thank you. Because they are application dependent and hence Based on your application, the system designer is the one that is coming up with the priority assigned. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there any other question? Good. So as I said, not all embedded devices would support nested interrupts or priority based interrupts, but because we have a Cortex M4, uh, it has this feature. There is another very interesting feature, especially for low power devices. If you remember from lecture zero, we also discussed that one of the challenges for embedded systems it's not like our desktops or laptops where power source is in fact very common for us and our battery is left for a few hours and then I can charge it back again. Some embedded devices, you want them to operate in a very low power for years might be, right? Without really changing your power source. So you have to be very conscious about how to deal with power. One way of, of handling uh, this power awareness is ARM M4 have a, a, a controller called wake up interrupt control. So it's a special type of controller and it's optional by them, by the way, which means some, okay, maybe it's a little bit of uh, 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 uninterrupt from the flow, but usually ARM, which is basically the one that is licensing the architecture of the ARM M4, for example, if you look into the M4 document, you will find that there are features that are basic, fundamental, and there are features that are optional. What does it mean? What, as a system designer, why should I care? It means that if you are a third party company, for example, NXP, want to license an M4 to do your K6X device. In that case, it's up to you. You're going to get the basic things, but based on what is your target application, you can also purchase the support for the, or implement the optional things, right? So, it, so when we say the NVIC is non-optional, it means any ARM M4 processor-based MCU would have the NVIC. But WIC, which is the wake up interrupt, it does not exist in all devices, right? So take it as an uh, exercise to check whether FM6X would have WIC or not, right? Just see how you can, can reach this out. But going back, so this was an interrupt. We're coming back again to, to, to the main routine. Wh why do we need a WIC and why it's related to the power? Because if I don't do a lot of activity, for example, you are an embedded device, well, maybe in the desert or uh, attached to a certain animal doing some activity, but then now, you are not doing anything. Instead of operating the CPU clock consuming power, something you can do is go in what we call a sleep mode, which is you save your power, but still once something happens and triggers, you can wake up immediately, right? Through an interrupt, and this is the WIC. Good. Okay, so this is in terms of controllers, in terms of register support, we need to handle multiple things for interrupts. Uh, we need to be aware of First of all, stack pointers. Why do we need to learn about stack pointers when we talk about interrupts? What do you think? From what we discussed a few minutes ago. So the interrupt process is I run a normal flow of a program and then I jump to the ISR and then come back. Why do I need stack pointers in that case? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, I would even say it's not easy. It's, you cannot really do it without stack pointers, right? Because what would happen in think of a normal program flow, not even interrupts. The way you jump from a function to another function, then your software knows that once you return or you hit the end of the function, go back to where you were at. The only way to do this is you need to push into the stack your program counter, right? At the very least. 
because otherwise the program wouldn't know where to come back, right? So in that case, uh, stack pointers are very fundamental. Stack is where you keep the data about your functions, threads, processes, and ISR is one of them. Good. So we have two stack pointers in the M4. One of them is called main stack pointer. The other one is called process stack pointer. Um, we will see what is the difference between them right now, but put this in mind. We need to handle stack pointers a little bit. We also need to know what is the program status register. Uh, as part of the program status register here, we have a register called interrupt BSR or interrupt program status register. This is the one that you need to set whether you are servicing the interrupt right now or not, or whether there is an interrupt to serve or not. And then there are also some masks here that the controller will use to know which interrupt to serve and which one in order not to serve. So looking into some of these program status uh, uh, registers, if I look into the interrupt one, which is the one that is interesting for us for interrupts here, IBSR, you will find here that there is a field in this register called ISR number. Why do I need this? I, I can serve up to 240 interrupts. I need to know which interrupt I'm servicing right now, right? So there's a special ISR to handle. So I, I can have multiple ISRs in my application, right? Because I can have 240 interrupts in my software. I need to know which one to jump to, right? The way to know this is your ISR number. So each ISR would get a certain number to serve. Uh, good. And then masking bits. We said that there are priority interrupts, lower priority, higher priority. I can serve an interrupt and then be interrupted by another interrupt. How this handled in hardware is through a set of registers. Some of them are called masking. So what does it mean? Some interrupts are maskable, which means if I'm writing my software right now as a software designer, I might choose to say during this critical section of my application, I don't want to be interrupted at all. So if you're doing something critical in terms of running time, you want to disable interrupts. Why that's the case? Because you want to guarantee a certain, for example, it's a feedback loop in a control system that would have to do with taking an action for a vegetarian, for example, right? Something that is safety critical. In that case, you don't want to be interrupted because once you are interrupted, well, it might take variable time, right? So in the, or, or at least it will take more time or more delay. So in that case, you can mask your interrupt. So masking means disabling, right? Most interrupts are maskable, but there are some interrupts that are non-maskable because again, based on what you are doing, some interrupts might be even more critical than the critical task you are doing. So we need to know from the hardware and the software which interrupts I can mask, which ones I cannot mask, and then do my analysis according to that. But aside from this discussion, system level discussion, you need the hardware support. So this hardware support is this basically masking register, which is a one bit that says, OK, if set to one, I will block all interrupts apart from the non-maskable ones. So if you write a one to that bit here in that register, you are saying, you know what, I'm not going to accept any interrupt. Other one, other than the ones that I cannot really mask. Good. And then you have variations of this. For example, uh, here you are blocking everything except non-maskable interrupts and hard fault exception. What, what is hard fault? For example, you went through some sort of an exception in your program execution. This is called hard fault. What if you want only to block the uh, to to? What if you want to block? everything including the hard fault but not the unmaskable so in that case you wouldn't be setting that bit but rather you would be setting the fault mask in uh, the fault mask bit which is this one so for the fault mask if you set it to one you would block everything including the fault the hard fault exception except the nmi with the unmaskable ones good so this one is even more uh, aggressive right because you are also blocking the faulty the, the fault exception ones uh OK, what if you want to be more flexible in the sense that I want to block interrupts? So I, I'm, I'm executing a certain program, and then I have certain priority within my interrupt. I want to block, block every one with a lower priority, but not a one with a higher priority, right? So I have now a fine grain control. Block everything on a lower priority interrupt, but not the higher ones, right? And this is the last bit here that you can use, which is the base uh, uh, masking. In that case, if you set it to one, which is this bit here in that register, if you set it to one, you will block all interrupts of the same or lower priority, but you, you will not block the higher ones, which in most cases it will make logical sense, right? 
because you, you don't want a lower Bernoulli interrupt to block a higher Bernoulli one. Make sense? Good. So that's the hardware support basically you need to be able to do all this flexible stuff. Again, this hardware support is only there if your MCU or your board is supporting vectorized interrupts, like support multiple interrupts, and uh, they can be nested. OK, so now let's try to reflect on some of this knowledge and what we have done already in lab one. So in lab one, uh, you have already wrote an ISR routine, right? So if you so remember this piece of code here, this was your ISR routine. Uh, and uh, <coughs> well, here I'm coming the right blocking, but if I use the right num blocking, I, I would keep. So I assume I'm using the right num blocking here. But before that, to be able to well, set up your system for what interrupt you are handling. I don't know if you paid attention to these lines, but as part of your UART setup, we had to enable interrupts to be able to use uh, interrupt based UART, right? So I uh, we, we have used these two methods from uh, well, existing library. Uh, one of them is called the enable interrupt, and this is basically the one that is what well, setting the num masking bits, set it to zero because you don't want to mask it. And um, you also wanted to enable a certain interrupt number, which is enable IRQ for the UART4, right? And then you need to write an ISR, which is what piece of software you need to execute when you really get an interrupt, right? So in a normal execution, I'm running this main code. At any certain point here, I might be interrupted because I enabled the interrupt. I need to jump somewhere. So this is where you are going to jump, which is your, your ISR, right? Which is just basically another method handling the, the UART. Okay. So now one good thing, if you want to, if you already need to understand all these details, which might be a, a bit boring and tougher to get from slide base, you can use the debugger in your MCU Express or IDE to be able to check all the steps we're going to discuss. So one of them is, I can in fact see all the registers, stacks, source code, and what I saw I'm servicing right now, what's happening in the program counter, where do I save it in the memory, all the steps we have for an interrupt, you can check step by step by using the debugger in the ID. And if you do so, you will see all these steps here, right? So these are the detailed steps that you need to do to really handle an interrupt, or the hardware would need to do to handle the interrupt in, in, a, in a correct way. The very first step is if you are interrupted in the middle of an instruction, well, you need to finish your instruction first. And this is a 4DM concept. So why that's the case? Why I just don't interrupt at any point, even if in the middle of an instruction? What do you think? Did you guys discuss exceptions on pipelining on 4DM or no? So can't just like immediately drop everything off the pipeline. Exactly. If you do this, there might be an instruction that already wrote to a register file, another one that calculated something but didn't really finish it. So in the middle of a pipeline, your system is not in a stable state, right? So if you drop, then it's not really safe to, well, you'll not be able, first of all, you'll not be able to come back in the middle because usually when you come back from the interrupt, you come back at the beginning for an instruction. But on the same time, some results that are in flight, you are losing, right? This is used, this is called exception handling in pipelines. And usually the trend, especially in embedded systems is finish your instruction finish uh, first, the one that you are executing, the ones that are in flight in the pipeline before you jump to the ISR. But a system level discussion here, what is the problem with this? What is the disadvantage or is the drawback? What do you think? Yeah. Exactly, this will delay your interrupt. So you have to factor in this delay. This is basically a context switch delay, right? So you have to factor in this delay as part of your ISR calculation. If your ISR has a timing budget, a deadline, this delay must be added to your calculations of the execution time. That's one thing. And uh, that's also true, especially if you are executing. This might not be for low end embedded systems, but in high embedded systems, that's the case. Some instructions are not very simple add and, and uh, subtract. Some instructions might take, in fact, 20 cycles, 30 cycles, like a multiplication or a memory operation. So in that case, this is a very long instruction. That's why we have the note here, which is might be in most systems. I'm OK finishing the current instruction if it's 
a quick instruction, one cycle, two cycles, three, four cycles. But if it's an instruction that is 10 plus cycles, I would rather interrupt. Okay? But I just told you a second ago that in fact you cannot do this. Otherwise, you're going to lose the status of your system. So what are you going to do? How to handle it correctly, right? It's usually a topic covered in 4DM, but from the faces, I feel that you guys didn't cover at all. Or might be, I don't know. So, so I will give you a very brief one minute discussion of this. So what would happen in a pipeline? We have this concept of flushing, right? You must have seen already in branch prediction or at least in some other context, right? So if I want to interrupt in the middle, I due to an exception or interrupt, your only way to do it correctly is to delete. I told you that there is an in-flight status right now, which is not written yet to the register file with the memory. I have two options, either complete it correctly and get the new status or delete it completely and go to the old status, right? So flushing is doing the other solution, which is I cannot wait for 20 cycles before I go to the interrupt. Then, okay, flush everything, assume this instruction never happened, and then I go to the interrupt service routine. Based on what option you take, what would differ? What do you think? Another bonus mark, a lot of bonus marks today. Yes, someone else. So, so based on what option I take, what I need to take care of, uh, uh, differently in terms of interrupt handling, in terms of the steps we have here. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So for example, for the program counter of the return, so let's pick this one because this is the more obvious one. What I will need, what I will do if I completed the instruction versus what I will do if I flushed the instruction. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So part of part of this process is that if you flushed, then in fact you need to return back. To, well, you assumed or your premise was that this instruction, as if it never happened, right? So in that case, when you come back from the ISR. You need to come back to the exact instruction, or if you went back multiple instructions in the pipeline, you need to go back to exact same instruction that you flushed. Otherwise, you lose it completely. Your program would be incorrect, right? On the other hand, if you allow those instructions to complete, then you will go back after those instructions or your program counter plus four, basically, right? So this this needs to be handled in a correct way. Okay, good. So this is basically the first one which we have already discussed here. Finishing the instruction, what you need to do. Once I finished the current, assuming I took the easy pass, I'm, I wasn't executing a load or a multiply, I was ex executing an add. I waited for a couple of cycles, I finished it, and then what do I need to do? Well, I cannot jump directly to the ISR, right? You need to push into the stack your current status of the program. Why that's the case? This is a context switch, right? So it's a context switch, which means once I come back, I need to continue what I have been doing, right? So the basic example I have given of you are studying for DS4, and then your brother comes, you are solving, you are in the middle of a problem. Maybe you just finished or solving a problem, then you solve the problem, but then you also want to remember where you stopped at, right? And what was the status stuff that when you come, you complete. It, it cannot be that when you come, you start from the beginning or start from a random place, right? So your mind would store a certain status such that when you go for the interrupt and come back, you continue what you have been doing, right? So this is basically what we need to do with pushing the context of the current stack. What does this context include? Well, it includes the registers, the program counter, any special handling registers, including return addresses, link registers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one thing you know, I would assume you already know by now about stack is that it grows in a decreasing address, right? So it's stack, the stack grows down while the heap grows up, right? Uh, I told you already that we have two stack pointers in, in uh, Cortex M4. One of them is called the main stack pointer, MSP. The other one is called process stack pointer, BSP. Uh, the reason for this is we have different um, what we call privilege modes in the M4 processor. So something can run in a normal user process mode. Someone can run in a privileged mode, which is ISR. So you need to store both basically, and we will see. And and based on your thread is in which context you would store in more or less a different stack pointer. Uh, so if you wanted to look, I have taken this screenshot from. Well, I believe this was lab one, if I remember correctly. So as I told you, you are able really through the debugger to see if you put a breakpoint somewhere before you go to the ISR, and then after you go to the ISR, you're able to see all the registers, including program counter, stack pointer, and any other 
special registers. And then uh, once you do the context, you will see that your memory is in fact updated with this, your stack is updated by these new values, which is saving your context, right? For example, here you saved R0, R1, like that, your special purpose registers. And then uh, you save the link register as well, program counter, and your uh, program stack. Uh, uh, what, did you, what did you call this? Process stack routine. I forgot what is BSR is. But basically, you store all your context in the stack, right? And I really advise you that if you didn't already try in lab one, you would be doing a lot of UARTs and uh, in, in the remaining labs. So it's very useful if you really try to do this debugging and see what happens in uh, in, in the IDE itself, right? Good. So I finished the current instruction. I did my context switch by saving all the status in the memory. Then now I can really switch to the other mode. So this thing is uh, an, uh, an ARM M4 special step. And the reason is, as I told you, the ISR, the interrupt routine, operates in a different mode than the normal thread, right? So the normal thread is running in what we call a thread mode, which can either be in the MB, uh, MSP or BSP, but the handler has to be in the MSP because the handler mode, the ISR, is in fact a privileged mode, right? To be able to, to, to interrupt your processor. Uh, so you need to switch. If you are running, in, for example, in the, in the thread mode or the normal mode, you need to jump into the privileged mode or the handler mode. As I said here, the handler mode is always using the MSP. OK, good. So again, I finished my instructions. I saved everything in the stack. I switched my mode of operation by setting a certain bet, which is the, the reset mode bet in, the, in a certain register. And now I'm ready to jump to the ISR. How to jump to the ISR? Well, it's as simple as jumping to any instruction, uh, to any function in your normal source code. What do you do is you load a new program counter into the BC register, right? So you load a new address into your uh, into your program counter. This is really how your program really jumps between functions, right? The program counter is loaded by a new address, and it's also, by the way, how you branch in a for loop or an if statement. Your program counter gets a new value. So you need to load the program counter with the address of the ex uh, exception handler. And then I also want to make sure before I start executing my handler is where do I return back once I'm done, right? If you are not interrupted, you will return back to the main thread again. So you need to store the original program counter that you are returning to in the link register, right? This is basically ARM has a special register called LR, which is the one that is storing the return address. Uh, so this is this is also uh, need to be stored into your uh, LR register. And then once now I'm I'm switching to my SR at the very beginning, I need to tell the hardware the general status that I'm currently executing this ISR. But this ISR how it's being defined. We said that every single ISR would have a number, right? What we call the ISR number. And in that case, you need to load this number into the IDSR, special register that stores the interrupt uh, program status register, right? Would, would store the number there. OK, good. Is there any question? Is the process? Well, I, I don't know if, I don't think you have discussed this process in this very low level detail before, but uh, is there any question? Or did you? I don't know. I don't think, right? But, but in fact, to be able to design something efficient, you need to go that level because later on we will see even how to calculate the timing budget of an interrupt. Without knowing all these steps, there is no way for you to really have a, a safe timing bound. Is there any question? Are the steps logical? Good. OK, so now I stored everything. I did all my due diligence. Now I'm ready to really start the actual execution of the ISR. Uh, so in that case, you start running your ISR. You are good as far as everything is okay. You are good if you have a simple system that only can have one interrupt at a time. All what we said right now can be well exponentially complicated if while you are executing the ISR, exact same thing can happen again, which means you are interrupted by another ISR. And then you need to do all this context switch, go again, then come back, right? So you are good in all these steps as far as there is one ISR running, but then they can really be nested if you have an instant interrupt. 
OK, once you are done with the with your ISR, you need to exit it, which means you need to load your LR to the program counter to jump back to the main program. And you need to make sure, do I need to return to the main program or do I need to return to a previous interrupt that I was servicing? And this might be different, right? And then assuming I went back to the, my main thread, uh, I will just res resume executing the main thread. How can I resume? Well, whatever status you have stored before in the stack, you load back, right? And then once you load back into uh, into your well, program counter is loaded back, all your registers are loaded back, uh, stack pointer now well, is back to its original status, and you continue executing the main. Good. Does this make sense? So in fact, the best way to teach this thing is, well, I we, we had an embedded systems course in Waterloo for second year students. Students used to implement this in assembly. So they have to write all these steps their own in loading the registers, the link register, the program counter, their own using ARM assembly instructions, which has been tough. But in fact, once you do it, you, you know by heart what is happening behind the scene. Right? So we don't have this here, but at least you can have the debugger by writing the simple C code, which saves you a lot of time, but still understand what happens behind the scene by debugging, right? Okay, so let's see how much time do I have I mean, Good. Do you need a break? Are you guys good? Is it too much? Okay. So Types of interrupts. We already mentioned, well, we are focusing mainly on the hardware interrupts, which are asynchronous. Again, what does it mean to be asynchronous? It's not an electronic asynchronous concept because in electronics, asynchronous means you have different clocks, right? Here, asynchronous means you are even triggered right, or event triggered, which means you are outside of the instruction execution. I can come at any time, regardless of what instruction I'm executing. Uh, while exceptions, false software interrupts, divide by zero or uh, multiply by undefined number, anything that is coming out of your program is in fact synchronous because it's triggered by an instruction. And as I told you already, we can enable or disable masks or mask instructions based on the registers. So you can say right now, I don't want to accept interrupts or I want to accept which ones to accept, higher priority, lower priority, all of these details. And then we already defined the ISRs with this, so just a summary. Now, given all these detailed discussions, what if I want to calculate? So assume you are designing a system. I'm telling you, well, please take my smoke detector or uh, um, take my, uh, let's say, ECG uh, alert in a patient or take my airbag control in a car or maybe my uh, balance in my balance detector in, in a drone. Implement it as an ISR and I give you this time budget to say, my response, if something bad happens, should be within, I don't know, 0.5 millisecond or 10 nanoseconds, any time, anything of time budget. How can you do it? We discuss all the hardware support, and maybe we touch it on what you need to write in software, given the lab example. But there is another system level design element, which is, am I within the time budget or have, how even I can calculate, calculate this time budget, right? Uh, so this is what we're going to discuss now. So interrupt response latency is how much delay you take until you respond to the interrupt, right? Why do we care? Because again, there is a lot of overhead in the steps we have discussed. If you think about the eight steps we have discussed or the seven here, if you think about these steps, which one of them is overhead and which one is the actual execution? What do you think? In terms of overhead defining, as an, again, another engineering concept. Which one you consider an overhead? Which one you consider an overhead? The point six are overhead. So that's actually executed. Exactly, right? All of this is overhead, except in fact, executing by itself, right? All what we are doing here in this six steps are continuous switch, right? I just want to make sure because I'm jumping, I'm doing it correctly. So in that case, all of this is not doing something from an execution perspective, useful instruction execution, right? It's necessary, but it's a matter of an overhead. So you cannot really say if I'm calculating my IBC, what is an IBC for DM? What is an IBC? Yeah, instructions per cycle or per clock. 
Uh, so basically, how many instructions did I execute, which is a measure of your performance of CPU? Then all of these six ones are in fact not part of your instructions because they are useless instructions. They are not part of the main program, and hence they don't contribute to the IBC. That's why they are overhead. Good. So now, why do we care? Because there is a lot of overhead that wastes time. Uh, and also because interrupt is taking me away from my own flow of the program. So in fact, there are two effects here. And, and that in, in a system level, I need to care about both. How much time does the interrupt take to execute on its own? If it's a critical interrupt, especially. And also how much time the interrupt is delaying the main thread of the program, if the main thread is a critical task, right? Because again, these are two sides of the problem that you need to take care of. If I want to calculate how does it long for the interrupt to execute, then, well, I need to revisit all the seven steps we have discussed. I finish executing the current instruction, push all the registers. I combine all these six steps into what I call here the C in interrupt response overhead, which is something that is basically an overhead. <laughs> Excuse me. And then if I do any memory handling, it will even take more time, but let's ignore this for now. And now we will make a few definitions of how to really budget the time of this execution. So I, I give you few symbols here that I'm defining. One of them is what I call F max N, the first one here. This is the maximum interrupt frequency. What does it mean? I can really bound how many interrupts I can serve within one thread, right? Because I can mask and unmask, it's up to me. So assume I'm running a normal thread in my, for example, a normal navigation thread on, on my car, and then I can, I'm going to say within this thousand cycles of execution, I'm going to serve only 10 interrupts. Five or a hundred, it's up to me, right? So your interrupt frequency, which is the rate of your interrupt, is how many interrupts you can serve within a certain time. And you can confirm, you can convert this to frequency by dividing by block time. This is F max N. Okay? And then I also know my CPU running frequency, right? Because this is from the data sheet. I call this FCBU. Now I need another metric. In fact, I need two metrics. One of them is the overhead itself, which is executing these six steps we had earlier. I call this C overhead. And then the step number seven, which is executing the actual ISR, this is called CISR, which is how much time it takes me, how many cycles to execute the instructions of the ISR. Good. And now based on these metrics, I can uh, start calculating, well, the interrupt rate and then the interrupt delay and how much time does it take? All under the premise that I'm executing one interrupt at a time for now, right? Because listed interrupts are much more complex to analyze. So what is the outcome? What I'm looking for? I'm looking for, well, calculating what I call my U end, which is my utilization, which is how much of the CPU computation power is taken by the interrupt. Right? So you can think of the CPU computation power, which is simply just your CPU time, right? Like if you go to AWS, for example, you rent CPU time for a certain, like a certain CPU characteristic, some memory for a certain amount of time and you pay some dollars, right? So CPU time is a precious resource, right? You want to see how much time does it take the interrupt out of this uh, resource. So we call it U end, which is the utilization of the interrupt which means how much time does it take out of the CPU time? And how do I calculate the U end or the interrupt utilization? Well, it's in fact a metric of all these uh, uh, symbols we have defined earlier, right? So I would say I want it to be a percentage because if my CPU utilization is 100%, which is my full resource, then the interrupt will take a portion of it. So I want it to be a percentage. So why I'm here like multiplying by 100% to make it a percentage. And then I'm saying, OK, if if end is my interrupt frequency, so it's a reflection of how many interrupts I serve within this period of time. I will multiply this because every one of those is one interrupt is going to take this full time, right? Because every single interrupt would take the overhead plus the execution time of the ISR, right? So this is the time that it takes to execute one interrupt. If you multiply the time of one interrupt by the frequency of the interrupt, and you divide by the CPU frequency, this in fact gives you the equation. Is the intuition clear? Good. What does this utilization really reflect? It reflects how much 
of the CPU resource is taken by the interrupt, by one interrupt. Yeah. And why that's the case? Because again, CPU looks like it's running the other two with the CPU block speed. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. If, if the interrupt has taken this period of time, how does it impact the main thread? Well, now the main thread you will see, instead of I'm seeing 100% of my frequency, I will see a portion of it, right? So instead of saying 100% FCPU, if you're running in 200 megahertz, because of your interrupts, as if you will see a lower frequency of the CPU, right? Because you've got a fraction of your CPU frequency. How to calculate this fraction is just simply one, because it's a percentage, minus your utilization of the interrupt. Is there any question here? Make sense? So in, in tutorials, we'll be solving problems related to this, and this might be a candidate for a problem in the final exam, right? So just wrap your head around it, try to think of how to design it uh, to be able to calculate the interrupt uh, uh, overheads. Is there any question before I jump into another design, design point? Okay. So volatile data, that's another thing you have seen in lab one, but I'm not sure if you paid enough attention to. So one problem we have with interrupts, which in fact exists even in non-interrupts, it's, it's, it's a general multi-threading problem in CPUs, that usually compilers would assume this program is running alone, which means it's the only thread in the system. Which means if I'm accessing a memory location, I'm going to bring this memory location to my own local register, right? So if you think about, well, let's uh, try our odds and see if we try the pen. So you have your CPU here. You have your set of registers. And then you have, well, multiple level of caches, and then you have the main memory. Assume I abstract all of this to assume I only have one big chunk of memory here. All your data initially exists in the memory, right? But memory access time is very large, right? Yeah, probably you know this from 4DM. So what most systems do is you bring your data from the memory. Assume, for example, you are accessing a, a variable called count. This count, the very first time you access it, the hardware will go to the memory, bring it, and put it in one of the registers you have, in your register file. Why that's the case? The register file access time is very, very fast. It's tightly coupled to the ALU. Its access time is just a single cycle. And if the data is there, you don't need to go to the memory or the bus or anything. It's very, very predictable, very, very uh, 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 high speed. What is the problem with this related to interrupts or any multi-threading thing? Is that if this variable count is shared with another, let's say I have a multi-core system, for example. And assume that this count is shared between the two CPUs. What is going to happen? is that this count will also be brought to the register file of the CPU. And by the way, register files are dedicated to a thread. So even we don't need to talk about, to talk about multi-cores, but rather about different threads running on the same CPU. Because the register file is per thread. And this is why you push your registers into the stack before you jump, right? So you bring the count here and you bring the count here in another thread. If one thread is modifying the count in the register file, what is going to happen to the other thread? This is a stale date, right? It's a wrong value of date. So that's in fact not possible for any shared data. Otherwise, you will have incorrect result, right? This makes sense. So why this problem is happening? It's a matter of performance optimization. So compilers and hardware usually bring the data for first time from the memory to the register file. As far as it's in the register file, I'm going to operate on it. And hence, I'm not going to update the main memory, except when I remove it from the register file. In the meantime, if another thread is updating it, it will see the old value. Okay. Uh, this optimization can fail. Uh, again, think of if you have an interrupt. So instead of saying two threads, I have the main thread, I have an interrupt here. I gave you this example of, well, let's go way back to our main example of this switch and LEDs. Here, so I told you that the ISR is updating the count based on the switch and then pass the count value to the main, right? Which means may, which means the count variable is in fact shared by the main thread and the ISR. 
The problem here is if both are updating it or one of them is updating it, the other one is not seeing the value, then the main might read the wrong value of the count. Why? Because I registered it already. For example, you press the switch once, then you pass it to the main, the main bring the count from the memory to the register file. It sees one as a value. Then you have another interrupt because you switch it again, but the main will not see it. Why? Because when you read the, your register, it's still one. You didn't get the value from the mem. Okay. So the solution to this problem is to use a special reserved word in C you have used in lab one, which is called volatile. Good. So what volatile does is you tell the compiler, don't optimize this variable. Every single time you access it, go ahead and issue a load instruction to the memory. Why? Because I know that, for example, the ISR might be updating it. Good. So if you go back to your lab one, you will find, in fact, we defined a couple of variables to be volatile. Yeah, as I'm saying here, C source code will simply result in an assembly language load register instruction. And more details about the word volatile can be found in this reference. So if you look into lab one code, you will find we defined, in fact, the character and the new character both to be volatile. Why are we doing this? Because we know that the ISR here is, in fact, updating the character and the new character while I'm also accessing them from the ISR, uh, sorry, from the main thread. So to be able to make sure I get the update value from the SR, I must make them volatile. Something you can try, very easy, remove the word volatile and see what happens to your program. You'll find that you will never get the correct value. Right? Good. So this problem, as I told you, it can be generalized. It has, it's, it's, it's part of the uh, interrupt discussion only because the interrupt is another context. If you don't do any interrupts, but you have multi-threaded program or multi core program, the same problem still exists. It's fundamentally because you share data among threads, right? So if memory is shared between the SR and the interrupted code, they can mess with each other. One can update while the other one still have access to a stale data. Here I'm showing you a good example. It's a bit of a puzzle. Let's look into it together. Assume I have a variable called count. I initialize it to zero as a global variable. And then inside the SR, I'm increasing count by one, which is this line here. And then in the main, I'm checking if count is equal to 10, I reset it. So I subtract 10. I already answered the question, what does this program intended to do? Now, the more question, the, 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 the more interesting question is that, is it going to do what we expect it to do? What do you think? Is the program is going to execute as we intend, which is the ISR is increasing it, and the main is checking the value with once it reaches 10, it reset it to zero. What do you think? So we, we have time, and you guys owe me uh, around uh, 45 minutes. I, I wouldn't keep you after after 12.30, but uh, just put in my, yeah. Yeah. What is stay at zero? Well, that's might be one way, but I guess you are like jumping ahead of your, like you're saying there is a problem and this problem might be that the counter will stay at zero, right? But at least you say that there is a problem, right? Is that correct or no? Okay. Yeah. Correct. And what might happen because of that? It's actually just count, like ever. Okay. Which might be a bit similar to what your friend was saying, but you both are correct. But what else can happen? Yeah. But the interrupt gets called, and so it points it as well. Then you have one thread documenting it by 10, another thread incrementing it at the same time. Yeah, oh. yeah, exactly. Good, thank you. So all, all what you said is correct. And the reason for this, in fact, 
we cannot really predict what can happen, right? It's, it's a bit unpredictable now. Why? Because it might stay all the time to zero, as you said. It might really, I change it to like subtract 10, and then all of a sudden the interrupt is also increasing. But does it increase by one, by two? I can get multiple interrupts, right? So it depends on what's really going to happen. So the interrupt might happen at different instances based on update value. What is the solution for this? Is what we have been discussing, right? The problem is because count is a shared variable. Everyone has its own version to operate in its own. So if I go back here, main, the very first time it reads count, it might be of a certain value, and then it will never see the update by the by the by by the interrupt. Like for example, assume initially, I don't have it as volatile. I read the count value at the beginning. It was zero and then one. Assume it's zero. Okay. So in that case, I keep checking if count is equal to ten. Well, no, it's zero, right? For the ISR, count keep increasing. But the increase is reflecting in its own local register, not the main memory. For the main, its local register is remaining at zero. So in that case, you will never go inside the F condition, right? And in that case, you will you will never, in fact, brain to reset the count, right? Does this make sense? So one at one side, like for example, like if I want to execute this exact instance of the program, you will see the print from the count. To go zero from the SR to go if the SR is triggered, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, keep increasing. On the other hand, you will never see a brand from the main. So that means you will never reset. Right? Why? Because I'm only looking into my own local version. What is the value of the local version? This is the very first value that you bring the, the variable from the memory, which is initially zero, right? So you see it as zero, and then you stop there. Good. The solution to this problem is, well, make it volatile, which means every time I read, don't read to your own local variable, local register, but rather go ahead and bring it from the memory. And if we, every time the SR writes, don't write into your own local variable, but go ahead and write to the memory. So if I want to draw it again, maybe it's better to explain it that way. So I'd say this is the context of the ISR. This is the context of the main thread. And this is my, my memory. Initially, Count is in memory, and it has the value of zero. Very first time I read in the ISR, very first time I read, uh, I get the count as zero in ISR in my register, and then I keep increasing, right? So I, I count plus plus, which means goes from zero to one, and then I say Brent count equal one. Good. And then, well, this is one one interrupt, right? So it's one. Assume it's one switch uh, press, right? For the main, I brought it to my local value count equals zero. I check. Does it equal ten? No. So I don't do anything. Assume another interrupt happens. So I I click the switch again. In that case, ISR executes, goes from one to two. It brings to me count equal two. And then I go back to the main. The main is checking. What value of count do I see? Still zero, because I have it here. I never flush it and read back. So in that case, if zero equal 10, no, I do nothing. Then you switch again, keep increasing, increasing. So you will keep increasing infinitely for that purpose, right? Why? Because all the updates are done by SR is never reflected in the main. Why? Because everyone has its own context. They are not aware of each other, right? So you ended up with a stale data. If I want to solve this, I will use the word volatile such that every time I write, so what is going to happen in the hardware is this is my SR context. This is my main thread. I bring the count. In that case, I might not even as a hardware and compiler to optimize, bring it in my local register. I always write there. So in that case, if I go to the ISR, increase the count by one. So I read it's zero, so it add to one. So I'm going to update this value to one. If the main reads, then, well, it will read from the memory. It will either see 0 or 1, but it doesn't really matter. Once the updated value happens, it will see it. Does 1 equal 10? No, so I break nothing. So the first thing you'll see from the ISR, count equal 1. The only time that the main will go inside the if statement, if you have pressed 10 times, so the count is 10, right? And in that case, you will see from 1 to 10. But at one point, once it's 10, the main supposedly is going to go to the memory, read it as 10, 
and then show you the reset code, right? Is that true? Would volatile only solve the problem for you? This, this is the next level of the trick. Yeah. And why? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. So that that that's another bonus mark, and I believe this is the part that you were highlighting also at the beginning before before the problem of the volatile. So the point here is that even with this word volatile, we went from the context problem into what we call a coherency issue, and this is another. 4DM topic. I don't know. Did you discuss cash coherence in any means in 4DM? No? Okay. So simply, if multiple threads or multiple cores share data, there is what we call a race condition because both can update, even if you are updating the same location here. Uh, where is the pen? Hmm. Interesting. So the only time that the laptop happened, oh, it's here. Okay. So um, so as as far as okay, I see the most updated value. I only update one location, but the problem is who updates first and who reads first, right? So now it's not matter of what value do I see; it's matter of when do I see it, right? So as your friend was saying, that if the interrupt is happening here, it's different than if the interrupt is happening here. because, for example, I can click twice. The interrupt happens twice. So, for example, assume I was at nine, okay. And then I here just before executing the F condition, I click twice. What is going to happen? You move from nine to eleven, so the F condition is still wrong. You will never see the ten value, right? Is that correct? So it depends on when, in fact, the interrupt happens, and when the main thread sees the updated value, whether your condition in the main will be executed or not. This is again a general problem, not just for interrupts, but for multi-threaded programming. It's called well, critical sections, as your friend said, maybe semaphores are solved with it, and it's more related to data coherence, right? So how what is the order that you see the reads and writes among different threads? Good. So as I'm showing you here, what if the interrupt happens before the main, right? What if interrupts happens after the if condition? Right? So in that case, for example, you will never reset to zero because if you increase the gain here, assume well, you saw the count as 10. And then you come here and say reset the counter, but before you reset, another um, interrupt happens. So you go from 10 to 11. So if you subtract 10, now it will go to one, not zero. So you will never reset, right? Why again? Because reads and writes from the ISR and the main are competing. So a race condition. Solution for race conditions is a very common discussion, both in operating system courses and computer architecture, which is again handling critical sections or semaphores. So the solution is to say, well, I want to. Well, this is this is just discussion of the race. So what's going to happen in that case? Um, assuming looking into the assembly and loading the counter value and then storing it, what is the order of the happening? I, I would I would rather discuss this in a, in a, in a detail in a, in a computer architecture course, but it's a matter of an advanced uh, advanced concept. But the idea is how to protect it. Well, the very first thing is you have to make sure you are very careful in your system design. Multi-thread programming is one of the hardest like problems. And in fact, it, it caused crashes in real industrial multi-million dollar products. You can read about this. Um, a, a general consensus also to uh, the coherency issue, the data sharing issue, is to use what we call single writer, multiple reader approach. It's called uh, SWMR, which means if you want a variable to be shared among multiple threads. It's better if you only make one of them write at a time, and then all others are only reading because writes and writes are very conflicting. And then the solution for our case here is to mimic the critical section by disabling interrupts. How do I disable interrupts? Do you think? A very basic question, a review of what we have discussed. How do I, what capability do I have to disable interrupts? Mask exactly. Thank you. So basically, I can use the mask bits, the hardware support that I have to say this is a critical section right now. I'm not going to accept any interrupt here. Just hold on your value until I reset and then accept the interrupt. Good. Good. Now, 
I go to the third level of the track. OK, I added here. My uh, my disable interrupt, enable interrupt critical section handling, so the interrupt will never happen between my my checking value of the count. Does this solve the problem completely? Well, in fact, no, if you have vectorized interrupts, if you can really have another interrupt within the ISR, right? So what if while I'm in fact increasing and before even printing, I get another interrupt, so I click the switch again. What do you think? Well, it would be also updated, right? The exact same problem, but not between ISR and main. It's now between ISR zero and ISR one, right? Correct. Make sense? Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. So this is based on what you design. So you have to really say, I want to disable interrupts of same or lower priority if I am operating this interrupt, which is something you can do in hardware. So that's this is what you will end up doing. That's correct, right? But for example, this count might not be even for the same interrupt. Right, so you, like you might be triggering multiple different interrupts uh, because the argument can say, okay, what if the count is also shared with a higher priority interrupt? Now I cannot really block it, right? So in that case, you would have the same problem. And the solution for this problem is, well, maybe I want also to disable interrupts sharing this variable with me, even if uh, they are higher priority, right? This problem. Them, we will discuss more when we come to real time operating systems, which is the next lecture or the lecture afterwards. It's called priority inversion. Why that's the case? Because assume count is shared with a higher priority interrupt. If I don't block it, I get the old value, right? So it's a stale, incorrect functionality. But if I block it, now I allow the lower priority interrupt to block a higher priority interrupt. That's why it's called priority inversion. It's very problematic for real time systems. It has solutions and we'll discuss them. Good. Is there any question? Okay. So this is, yeah, given that we were discussing nested interrupts. So in general, I can be in the main and well, I'm interrupted by maybe a, a switch click. I go to one interrupt and then this one is interrupted by a higher one. I go to it. Once I'm done with this one, this flow is exactly the flow of a functional call, function call in, in a normal program stack. Then once I finish this one, and well, I was interrupted, so I finished this one. I go back to the same interrupt I was in, and then I go back to the main, right? In ARM Cortex M4, in fact, you have the option. So you can say, I might go directly from this interrupt to the main if I want, if I was delayed by too much, for example. But you have to be careful because in that case, you didn't execute the ISR fully. So again, you are in this transient state of the system, which might be incorrect, right? But it's up to the system designer to do so. How nested interrupts are handled in, in ARM is through the um, Victorize, the NVIC uh, or NVIC controller. Uh, you can manage and virtualize interrupts. We said we already have 240 out of them. Uh, we said already interrupts are types of exceptions. N capital here is how many interrupts you can handle. Uh, and we said you already have two modes of operation, the thread normal mode and the handler mode. Uh, all, all this is also handled by the NVIC. Uh, but the point here is NVEC is getting multiple interrupts. It has to check all their priorities. It has to check all their status and then nest them accordingly, right? So it's, it's in fact a complex piece of software, uh, sorry, of, of hardware. So NVEC is, is, is quite advanced. And this is why I would assume in other uh, non ARM based embedded systems, you will not find a vectorized interrupt, right? Um, good. So we are up to a summary. So what did we cover uh, so far? So um, the, the important takeaway is, is we need to calculate how much time does it take us to work on an interrupt. So we have to go through all the seven steps of the interrupt, understand them, discuss the trade-offs, and then, well, try to model them in a sort of an equation to come with the, what we call the interrupt utilization and uh, the remaining utilization for the main thread. Um, should you enable or disable interrupts while you are in ISR. That's another concept we discussed. Uh, how to communicate between ISR and other threads. We said, well, this might be through volatile variables, but that's not the only solution. What if there is shared data? You need to enable disable interrupts as if you are mimicking critical sections. Uh, and you have to pay attention to yeah, 
it's non-atomic data sharing and how volatile data can be handled. By doing this, we are done. So I would say uh, thanks everyone. Uh, it's just an acknowledgement that this is a collection of slides from a few different sources, especially for Cortex M4. I used a lot of slides from ARM. Um, and the next week we'll start the real-time operating systems, which will align with Lab 2, because Lab 2 is the R2 stuff, the free R2 stuff. This will align with the next Thursday lecture. Uh, see you all next week.